Um, this chart is available for download in Module 6. I strongly suggest downloading it. It describes how the five types of IP differ in terms of what can be protected, how it is protected, the length of the protection, and the cost of the protection. Let's begin with trademarks. Trademarks can include letters, numbers separately or combined into words. It could be design, it could be slogans, it could be characters. All of those things can be trademarked. Trademarks are the recognizable symbol, the logo, the name of specific business entities. The McDonald's arch and the Nike swoosh are both trademarked. They are the seal of assurance, if you will, to consumers that the product is indeed the McDonald's hamburger that we expect when we go to the arches. Consider if any restaurant could use the arch outside the door and say it was a McDonald's branch. The consumer would be easily defrauded and McDonald's would lose business and thus profit. Okay, in terms of trademarks, let's look at um, three ways that a company or someone can um, violate use of your trademark. The first is really very straightforward. It's infringement. So if somebody uses your trademark for the same type of product, okay, their intent is to defraud the customer. For example, um, as on the screen, um, a uh, purse manufacturer manufactures um, purses that have the Coach logo on them and then they're going to sell them as coach bags when in fact they are not coach manufactured bags. Okay? Um, a restaurant opens with the name In-N-Out Burger or McDonald's. If those companies are using the trademark um, name in order to basically steal business away from the legitimate company. Okay? Um, there is also trademark dilution by blurring. Okay, so trademark dilution is when the worth of somebody's trademark, okay, is lessened because of somebody else's use of the trademark. Okay, and in this case, um, the trademark is value is lessened by blurring. So in this, for example, um, in an out burger, um, another company, it's a dry cleaners, opens an In-N-Out Cleaners, and that's their logo. Um, In-N-Out Burger could sue for trademark dilution by blurring because um, they could assert that the uh, logo and the name will lead the um, consumer to be confused, and in being confused about the product, therefore, um, the trademark in and out and that very, you know, um, cool arrow, uh, its worth was lessened. Okay. Another way is a trademark dilution by tarnishment. And that's when um, somebody's trademark um, is being used in a distasteful way or on a poor quality product. Okay. So um, you can see very clearly that the, the Coca-Cola that really it is in it's in poor taste or distasteful if you're using the name Disney on an adult bookstore. Um, is well Disney can sue everybody, but you understand what I'm saying there. Okay. Also, in terms of poor quality products, so for example, if you buy a product and it says it is. Um, for example, Tide laundry detergent, and you've come to expect Tide laundry detergent to actually be good, okay? Um, and it's such a poor quality product, um, like there's no bubbles, there's no absolutely anything, okay? Um, you're also tarnishing the reputation of Tide because the person then believes that the Tide product is not as effective which lessens the, uh, the company's um, revenue. Okay. So basically trademark infringement, um, it usually happens by blurring or tarnishment. Okay. Um, okay, 
we're going to talk about trade dress, okay? And just think in terms of dress as the clothes for something. So trade dress is um, a facet of trademark protection that protects the packaging of a trademark good, okay? So these are three examples of trade dress. So, for example, the shape of the Coke bottle. We don't see bottles anymore, but um, that has protection, okay? Um, the product packaging that is a packaging for, uh, it's really hard to see, um, a kind of headphones and it makes it look like it's on a museum pedestal. Okay. So that would also be considered trade dress. Okay. The Apple store is a container for goods produced by Apple. It, the store has a unique design and feel the way the store is set up. Okay. Um, the way, the way the product is displayed, okay? the lighting, um, all of those things are protected. Okay? So while it's important to consider trade dress in you know, regards to the product shape, the packaging, or stores, okay, the real relevance um, in tech com has to do with trade dress for website protection. So let's just think about um, the website on the left. So um, Slim Blast uh, created their website and they're selling their product. All Day Slim manufactures a similar product and creates their web, the website on the right side. Okay? In order to claim copyright infringement on a website, okay, it needs to be pretty much the same. This is pretty much the same. Um, there's nothing really that's different except the name um, of the product okay, and the picture of the bottle okay, and probably the fine print on the bottle okay but um, if we consider that a website is a container for goods produced by a certain company okay we could see how trade dress might be applicable to protecting that look and feel so Trade dress is generally what is protecting the look and the feel of a website. If you use all, you know, uh, just a very sparse, minimal effect like Google, okay, if there's nothing else on the page except something at the top and a search bar, very minimalist, um, Google could say that you copied the look and the feel. Even if it didn't say Google, okay, um, if it felt like the look and the feel would confuse the consumer, okay, there may be a case for infringement. So one of the very first cases to assert the protection of a website's look and feel under trade dress uh, was Blue Nile um, versus iStock Comment. Their jewelry website, um, you could go ahead and take a look at the readings um, that we have. Uh, design of a website and trade dress protects the look and feel of a website in the course readings. That will, those will explain the reasoning behind um, court decisions uh, based on trade dress in regard to a website design. I, I expect that there will be many, many more cases as websites become even more uh, relevant and really just uh, proliferate. So we're going to talk about patents now. There's two kinds of patents. The utility patent, which protects the functional aspect, how something works, whereas the design aspect protects how something looks. Sometimes it's pretty easy to determine what kind of patent would cover a product. Okay. Um, so let's take a look at these winged sandals, which, by the way, look at the price. Okay. Let's go back and look at the sandals. Okay. So the design of the winged part of the sandal has the design patent, okay? There's nothing new about how it holds your foot into the shoe. The uniqueness isn't a part of the function. The uniqueness is a part of the design. Therefore, a design patent would be used. Here's a patented design for a pressure washer um, holder, okay? So, uh, the entire 
uh, patent application is in the course readings for the module. I want to point out um, that the document for the patent application for this um, product is eight pages long only. And two of the pages uh, are two of the views of um, the actual holder for the washer. Okay. Um, so if you take a look at the image on the left, the part of the design that is solid lined is the part of the design that is being protected. The dotted, not solid lines, are included for the purpose of showing environmental portions of the design. It needs to show what's around, okay, the part that you would like to patent, okay? How does the part you want to patent connect to other parts of the product, okay? Um, so uh, in this one, the dotted lines, those parts, there's no claim made to the portion um, for ownership of that. Um, sometimes, however, the function and the design are very closely related, and sometimes even the a product has both types of patents. The Adidas spring blade created a new athletic shoe with a distinctive shape of the sole. Okay, they could file for a design patent for the look of the sole and a utility patent for the new improved rubber plastic whatever bounce um, that the cool shape brings or that it's made out of. Okay, the patent for this one's also in the course readings. Okay. Um, the application for this one, however, is 25 pages long. That means three times the size of the other one. Okay, And it includes each of the individual components of the sole and how they connect to the bottom of the shoe. Okay, So in this one, the way something works is inextricably linked with how it works. So both are protected. So. A patent is an exclusive permission granted to the creator of a unique method of performing some action or developing some product by the country in which the creator or inventor resides. So inventor creator we're going to represent with IC. Okay. Okay. Although an inventor creator can sell the patent rights to another organization, the sole right to control this transaction re rests totally with the inventor creator. Okay. Countries grant patents so that economic development is stimulated by intellectual development. Okay? When a creator inventor applies for a patent, they are exchanging secrecy over the patented product method process for the exclusive right to exclude others from using it. Okay? However, someone cannot reverse engineer a product that is patented and put the exact same product on the market. So in the case of a patent, the patent owner has protection against others' independent discovery of the exact creation of the item. So trade secrets are another form of IP that's regulated. Okay? Trade secrets are anything that a business uses to obtain a competitive advantage. Sometimes it's proprietary techniques, materials, formulas, client lists, etc. Um, the formula for Coca-Cola is a trade secret. Okay? Trade secrets do not have time limits. So consider if Coca-Cola, which by the way was invented in 1886, um, had relied upon copywriting or patenting the formula um, for protection. The protection would have expired years ago. Um, consider too that in order to protect a patent, the formula has to be disclosed in the patent filing. Okay. You can see how trade secrets have their place in types of IP. Okay? It's also worth noting that oftentimes prospective employees have to sign a non-compete and non-disclosure agreement with their employer, which is meant to protect the employer's trade secrets and other proprietary IP. This is often the case with client listings. So on one hand, trade secrets um, you don't have to disclose a formula. You don't have to apply for a trade secret. You don't have to pay a filing fee for a trade secret. And the term of protection is as long as the secret is kept. The drawback is, though, how are you going to keep it a secret? Okay. The um, 
recipe for Coca-Cola is um, split up in different locations with different manufacturers. Um, that is one of the ways they keep that protected. Okay. Understand, though, that there is no protection against independent discovery. So, for example, if somebody goes and discovers the formula for Coca-Cola by researching and studying and whatever, okay, they can market the product. Of course, they can't call it Coca-Cola okay, um, because that is a trademark, but um, consider how many different kinds of colas there are on the market, all of the store brands, the proprietary band, brands, but none of them taste exactly alike. Um, because the formula is so complex, nobody's gotten it exactly right. Um, but trade secrets, you have no protection um, against somebody uh, independently discovering your trade secret. Make sure to read... Um, there's a web page in the readings that explains what ICANN's role is um, in internet domain names and IP addresses. Okay, ICANN is another organization and it plays a role in regulating cyber squatting. Cyber squatting occurs when a person or company registers a domain name in bad faith. Okay? They either look to see companies that don't have their websites yet and who have not purchased the, all forms of the names, such as fries.com, fries.net, fries.biz, okay, with the hope that when fries realizes they need the domain name, they're going to have to pay the cyber squatter a large amount of money to get it, like it's being held hostage. Another issue with cyber squatting occurred because of how URLs are constructed. Okay, In countries other than the U.S., each domain must have a country code as the top level domain, the TLD, okay? Um, so that is the last component, okay? So um, cyber squatters capitalized on the fact that companies would eventually want to have a web presence in each country. So they purchased the domains associated with large companies or very common names for each of the countries. So for example, McDonald's in Brazil um, has the URL mcdonalds.com.br and Australia it's .com.au in Russia it's just mcdonalds.ru so cyber squatters can do this for any company that might you know how many ABC companies are there in the world probably quite a few um, so a cyber squatter would go and buy for example abc.com.br, um, abc.com.au, abc.ru, okay, and hold on to those um, until the company that um, should have the domain um, wants to buy it. So a lot of times when you're on a website, um, you go to a web address and it says that the um, page is under construction. Um, that is usually because a cyber squatter has purchased it, okay, and is basically holding it until somebody wants to buy it. Um, as a side note, um, you might be wondering why the U.S. doesn't use their country code, which is .us, okay. Um, it's because the top level domains .com, .edu, .mil, .org were all introduced in 1984 before the first country codes were assigned. Okay? And in the United States, um, there was quite a bit of internet activity before um, 1984. Um, so then when um, those TLDs were exclusively used by American organizations, and um, the TLD.US was just not widely pushed. So generally, um, if something is just a .com or a .org with nothing after it, it means the US. I, have, I don't think I've ever seen a website that actually has .US on it.
In this lecture, I've explained how some of the IP issues that are involved in the digital domain. Um, but I thought this graphic was especially helpful to understand the reach of IP. Okay? This is a graphic that was created in Malaysia. Okay? Um, I want to point out two sections that are not applicable in the US. Okay? The sui generis database law protects the investment that a company has in creating a database and collecting the records. Okay? In the US, this doesn't qualify for protection as copyright because it's considered uncreative. Think um, telephone listings. Okay? So it doesn't qualify for copyright protection in the US. Okay? But in the European Union and Malaysia, there is protection against copying the content of a database. Okay? Industrial design is also not a separate set of IP protections in the US. Instead, products or designs are covered by design patents or copyrights when applicable. Um, however, this graphic is really useful in understanding all of the IP that a simple um, product could involve. So as you're sifting through the readings and considering IP's reach into typical businesses, think about this graphic. Okay? Um, it also might come in um, handy for the discussion for this week. And as usual, if you have questions, go ahead and post them to Hallway conversations.